My name is David Haselbach and my lab is interested in how molecular machines are working. Our cells are filled with small, tiny protein RNA or just protein machines that fulfill all the functions in the cell. These machines are different than the machines that we know in our daily life. These machines are different than a car because they are not fueled by a chemical energy. They are mainly fueled by the environmental energy. So they have to have different design principles. And to understand these design principles is the aim of my lab. To do so, we do structural biology. Our mantra as structural biologists is structure equals function. So we can infer function from structure. This seems to be odd if you think about it, because structure is static. Structure gives you the coordinates of atoms in a molecule in relation to each other. However, function is transient. This is something that changes with time. Whatever molecule or whatever machine you would imagine will always have some kind of change in time. So we have to understand the machine, not only understand the structure, but also understand the change in time. So let's define function now, not as structure equals function, but function is the change in structure with time. To understand that, we use mainly the method of single particle cryo EM. In single particle cryo EM, we, as in any structural biology method, we purify our sample into an Eppendorf tube, and then we bring it into an electron microscope on a grid, which is often a carbon surface, where the molecules are now distributed and frozen in ice. We bring it into a transmission electron microscope, which makes perfect 2D projections out of these molecules. They are randomly distributed and randomly oriented. To now calculate a structure from that, we use an extensive computational scheme, and I'm showing you here one negative stain micrograph. The first thing that we have to do is we have to identify the molecules. Once this is done, we can cut them out, and you will see they are randomly oriented, but they are centered. The next thing that you see is that they are quite noisy. To get rid of this noise, we have to average them, but we cannot just average them one by one. We have to sort them and really orient them in the right rotational angle. So this is the first thing we do. We orient them in the same rotational angle, and then we say that the particles that are the same view, like this one, this one, and this one, we can average together and get class averages like this. The next step that we have to do is we have to find how they're oriented in space, which you see here, which we also do computationally. And from this, we can project back into 3D space and see a final structure here. However, this is just the initial assignment of angles, so the initial approximation of the structure. This we do for many iterations until we get from a low resolution structure to a relatively high resolution structure where we see all the structural features that we want to see and we see actually amino acid side chains in the very end. A few words on how long does that all take. Well, in a normal project we will start with biochemistry to actually purify our molecule of interest which can take a couple of months. In a complicated case can even take a couple of years. Imaging is fairly quick in a few days. At most in a few weeks you have enough images to work the rest uh, of a PhD project, meaning a couple of days in a very good case. In bad cases it can again take years. The molecules that we are interested in are all in the vicinity of the proteasome ubiquitin system. And this is the human proteasome that we see here. And it works in the following way. That we have a substrate that is tagged by a chain of ubiquitin that is recognized by the proteasome itself. The tagged ubiquitin chain is removed from the proteasome and then under the use of the environmental energy plus chemical energy by ATP, the substrate is unfolded and threaded into a proteolytic chamber, which you see here in gray. In this proteolytic chamber, it's cut into pieces and these pieces, these peptide pieces, are then released from the proteasome. Generally, we have understood much about these mechanisms, but we haven't understood all the details and what we are mostly interested in my lab is what happens if the proteasome is troubled. So what happens in disease and stress states for the cell. And what are these stress states? It's oxidative stress and heat stress, but also intoxication by heavy metals like arsenide. On the other end, there's disease proteins that you might know from neurodegenerative diseases, like from Huntington's disease or from Alzheimer's disease. 
These proteins are very troublesome for the proteasome on the other end. There's viral proteins where the viral design is in a way that the proteasome will have trouble with it so that the virus can escape proteasomal degradation. All of this is rather heterogeneous to, to analyze. So in the lab, we use two proteins like these two that we can homogeneously give to the proteasome, which we know will trouble the proteasome. Use them to analyze the effects of troublesome substrates. The actual workflow of the proteasome, especially in the beginning of recognizing the substrate, is still mysterious in many ways and debated. I'm showing here the interpretation from the Martin lab in Berkeley. And this is what has to happen on the proteasome. So the proteasome has to bind the polyubiquitinated substrate. A tail or a part, a terminus of the substrate, has to be inserted into the ATPase. This has to be engaged deubiquitinated and translocated. The order of events and which events are really important, we don't know yet. And it's highly debated. What is the reason for that that is highly debated? And why is this a black box? Well, it's vastly complicated. There's at least, when you take four ubiquitins, you have at least 1030 different possibilities to make a ubiquitin signal. The proteasome has to distinguish them because not all of them, and only a small fraction actually of them, is competent for the proteasome to degrade. Secondly, there's not only one receptor that recognizes the ubiquitin chains, there's several of them, and there's at least three known, but there must be a fourth one which hasn't been identified yet. And lastly, the proteasome can degrade most of the proteins of a human cells, and in human cells, at least 8,000 different substrates, ranging from a few amino acid length to several thousand amino acid length, and even entire complexes can be degraded. And the last complication of the whole system is that is relatively fast. This whole process of these five steps here takes less than a second. So this is really hard for us to tackle, especially with methods of structural biology. To, however, get still information out, we're trying to establish in the lab a method called time-resolved EM, which is originally described by Nigel Unwin in the 1990s. This was further developed by the Nobel laureate Joachim Frank in the last few years, and now we also start and build our own setup. To quickly tell you how things are working, I have to tell you how do we prepare our sample. And this works in a way that we have our sample in a pipette tip here, and we have an electron microscopic grid here and we pipe it on the grid, just normally by hand. This is, in principle, the speed, how we would do it. We have a microscopic filter paper that makes the film very thin, and in this very thin film that is a few nanometers thick only, we have our molecules moving. This thin film we just put into liquid ethane, where it's then frozen and the molecules are frozen in ice. All of this process takes a couple of seconds, which would be too slow for everything that we want to see. However, the freezing itself is very fast. This happens in microseconds. So as soon as the grid hits the liquid ethane, it's frozen. This is the good news. So the only thing we have to solve is we have to be faster in applying the sample, mixing and applying the sample to the grid. And this we do in a quench flow or stop flow kind of fashion in which we have a microfluidic chip or another kind of device that I'll show you in a minute where we mix the substrate and the proteasome and add different delays after mixing before we apply it to the grid. Our device is very similar to the standard device and this is my first drawing of the device, how I wanted it. We have a forceps and the grid, the microfluidic chip that mixes and the ethane here. And the device that I built together with the IMP workshop is looking in principle like that and we have a look how it works. So this is the device, it's roughly as high as I am. And here we have the grid and here the microfluidic chip. The grid will fall down while the microfluidic chip will mix and spray the sample into air and the grid will fall through, which we see here. And then it's quenched. In reality, this looks like that. So this is the actual device. And we have two versions of the machine working. One is the microfluidic chip, which we have here, that I just told you about. There we see the machine working, the chip goes through and the forceps falls down. In an alternative approach, we use a piezoelectric sprayer device that we built that mixes and sprays at the same time. So we can be even a little bit faster than with the microfluidic chip. And this is working here. So we see it spraying and falling down. All these movies are slowed down. This is done with high-speed cameras, so this is much faster. This happens in milliseconds. 
So what can we do with that when we now put our proteasomes? And I'm presenting here the very first results that we got with this device. And there we look still at hundreds of milliseconds, just as proof of principle, where we mix our proteasome substrate with the proteasome. And we look at the receptor here and the ATPase here. And when we look at all the particles, and this is just a few particles, a few thousand particles, and look at the heterogeneity that happens, we have a large heterogeneity on the receptor. However, there's an interaction to the ATPase which has not been seen before. What we hypothesize is that this ATPase part, which is called coil here, will actually be involved in the recognition of the substrate. To prove that, we made a biochemical assay in which we disturbed this interface. And indeed, this is the coil coil that we look at. And we see degradation compared to here, to the control where degradation happened. And we see fairly nothing of our substrate anymore. The substrate stays more or less untouched, but deubiquitinated on the proteasome. So we can, by interfering with this coil coil, we can interfere with this process, which is interesting. However, what you also see here, this is not just one structure, this is fairly complicated still. So we have to do something against the dynamics because the molecule will still move on a smaller time scale that we can actually synchronize. To do something against that, we use methods of machine learning in my lab to understand these movements. And what are these movements like? These movements are environmental movements and this is movements like a wackeldacke. So the movement of the car here will move the head of the wackeldacke and the same, the movement of the cell or the, the liquids in the cell will move, the thermic movement will move the head of the proteasome. And if we take random subsets of our particles and calculate structures, you see there is a movement. This is hard to comprehend. So we want to get a trajectory on this. To get this done, we use principal component analysis. So we use all of these randomly chosen particle 3D averages and put them into the principal component analysis and get a linear description of this movement and how this looks, I show you in the next slide. This is one of these principal components that doesn't look much like a proteasome. However, if we take the average structure, which is this one, and the linear factor that we get as outcome of the principal component analysis, and we iterate through this linear factor, we can actually model a movement. And we can see the movement that the proteasome is doing and it's the head domain or the, the regulatory particle that is rotating against the core particle here. To analyze this a little bit deeper, we can actually figure out which particle is in which conformational state. And we can count them and can say, okay, there's a several thousand in this state. So this is an energy minimum because most of the particles are in there. And we can see how this movement goes. And if we move through our energy landscape or our functional energy landscape, we will see that the proteasome does these movements. And we even have an energy barrier from an inactive state to an active state. And we can actually understand that. The power of this method is that we not just find a few movements, but we find all possible movements that the proteasome can do. And we find things that haven't been described before, like the movement of a subunit, which is called RPN1. RPN1 is one of the three ubiquitin receptors. And this can move tremendously on the surface of the proteasome, probably to make room for the large differences in sizes of different proteasome substrates, which you can see here. So we can find a wealth out of information by just using this one method. Finally, when we now use all these methods, what would we want to do in the future with that? How can we understand things and what is more in biology? And I told you before that we don't know quite the logic yet of the proteasome, but we know that the cell can tweak this logic. How does that do that? Everything is about time here. In the beginning, a substrate has to be recognized by any three ligase, and this is brought to the proteasome, unless a deubiquitinating enzyme in the cytoplasm will deubiquitinate the substrate and it never reaches the proteasome at all. Or actually another E3 ligases gives a signal that is not a proteasome specific signal and binding will be prohibited and nothing happens. Additionally, there's a couple of deubiquitinating enzymes that are actually on the proteasome. And if it's not successful to start the processing of the substrate, until the action of this dubs happened, 
the substrate will just dissociate back from the proteasome, uh, go back to the cytoplasm and is not degraded. To prevent this mechanism and actually set the right dwell time, so the time that the substrate is staying on the proteasome, there's E3 ligases also on the proteasome that work against that. The cell can now, by expressing and bringing DUPS and E3 ligases to the proteasome or taking them off them, determine the time that the substrate can stay on the proteasome to be successfully degraded. This makes all sense. We can see from first clinical trials of an inhibitor of one of these DUPS that was spearheaded by the Finlay lab from Harvard. They found that if you inhibit this USP14, you have effects against inflammatory diseases as well as neurodegenerative diseases because you just increase the dwell time on the proteasome and substrates that are normally challenging for the proteasome would be degraded in time still. And with this, I come to an end. This is my group. We have a lot of collaborators with which we calculate structures. This is a few example structures that we're doing, and this is the funding we receive. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you.